Hello there. I uh, made this video to support you in your photo scavenger hunt this week. And in the scavenger hunt, you will be looking around and taking photos of electronic components that exist in your home. Now, the purpose of this activity is to help you uh, look for and think about the daily application of these components that we often take for granted in our daily lives. That being said, this is on the honor system. This activity is most enriching when you're up on your feet, uh, walking around your house and uh, looking for components. And so what I'm doing is I'm assuming that if you are Googling pictures of appliances with these components, I am trusting that you have made a decent effort to go around and look for them. Now, to give you an overview of what we're gonna go over in this video, I'm gonna begin by talking about the uh, two different types of switches that you're going to see. Then I'm going to go over what power adapters do. Then we're going to talk about potentiometers, a cool new electronic component. And then next, we're going to take a look at an infrared LED. And yes, they do exist all around your house, and so it'd be cool to take a look at one. And finally, uh, we'll do a brief exploration of case design, or really the case that's designed to protect the electronics inside. So let's begin. So switches are critical components in any circuit that require any form of user control. So what I've done is essentially created an example of a switch using the circuit. So here we have a battery which goes from the positive end over to this metal plate which will act as my switch. Um, there's the resistor which goes to the positive end of the LED and then that LED and the negative end of the LED goes back to the negative part of the battery. As you can see right now, the LED is not turning on. And the reason why it's not turning on is because there is a huge gap here preventing current from, from flowing from this metal plate all the way to uh, this other end of the resistor over here. So in this current state, the circuit is open or it's an open circuit. This simulates the switch being off, but if you turn the switch on, so I'm gonna take this resistor and make contact with the metal plate, we can see that the LED is lighting up. In this case, it is said that the circuit is closed or it's a closed circuit because there is a continuous path from the battery through the metal plate to the resistor, to the yellow wire, to the positive end of the LED, out the negative end of the LED, and back to the negative end of the battery. Essentially, it's a closed loop for electric current to go through. Now you can imagine it would be a huge pain to have to manually cut the wires or manually have to undo the alligator clips every time you want to turn the circuit on or off. And that's the main function of the switch. Switches allow you to open the circuit or close the circuit with relative ease. Switches come in two styles. Uh, they can either be maintained switches or momentary switches. And so over on my portable sander, I have an example of a maintained switch over here. So what a maintained switch is, is that it stays in one state until it is flipped off. So these switches can also be called toggle switches or on and off switches. So for example, right now it is off and it will stay off until I press the on. And when I press the on, it will stay on until I press off. So the other type of switch is something called a momentary switch. And a momentary switch only remains active as long as the switch is being pushed or being actuated. If the switch is not being pushed or actuated, it will remain in their off state. Now this switch here is called a normally open switch. It is normally open like this. And when the button is pushed, it closes and connects the red to the yellow, creating a path for the electrical current to flow. So over here is the LED. And as I push the momentary switch, the LED turns on and it stays on as long as my finger is on the button. When I let go of the button or the switch, it automatically turns off. 
A push button is an example of a momentary switch, but it isn't the only kind of momentary switch that exists. As a helpful simplification, and as I mentioned in my last video, voltage is a pushing force that pushes electric current uh, along the circuit. Every circuit needs some sort of a power source that supplies voltage, and without that power source, that circuit simply wouldn't work. Now, there are a variety of different power sources, but one very common example of a power source would be a battery. What's essentially happening is inside this battery, there is a chemical reaction that essentially creates a voltage or that pushing force for the electrons. And in this example, this battery over here is called a D battery, and it produces 1.5 volts of electron pushing force. All right, and uh, over here is one of my power adapters. As you can see, the plug is over here, and that taps into the AC voltage that's in the walls. The power goes all the way through the cord. It goes into this magical black box. And actually, if you look very carefully, the black box will uh, tell you um, what's actually happening in here, mainly what, uh, what AC voltage it accepts from the wall and what, what, what we expect to come out on the other end in smooth DC voltage. So it turns my wavy AC into smooth DC and then it comes out through the other end along this cord and all the way into the little barrel jack which plugs into my laptop. Now in electronics, you're probably used to working with fixed value resistors like these ones. These resistors have a value that don't actually change. So for example, let's see how much resistance this resistor gives. To do that, I'm gonna pull up the multimeter and you know that it can measure voltage as we did last day. You know it can do a continuity test, but it can also measure resistance. It's almost like it's a multiple meter. Now I'm going to set it to the omega symbol, which is the symbol for ohms, and ohms is the unit of measurement that measures resistance from one point to another. So I'm going to take one lead, take it to another, and as you can see, this resistor produces 149 uh, ohms of resistance, and that doesn't change regardless of how much reverse psychology or positive reinforcement you give it. Just watch. I bet you couldn't be a 2000 ohm resistor. See, still 150, and uh, this time we're going to try positive reinforcement. I believe that you can be a 2000 ohm resistor if you truly believe it. If you can dream it, you can achieve it. See, still 150. And that's why they call it a fixed value resistor. It's a resistor that doesn't change its value despite a variety of parenting techniques that you apply to it. Now more common around the house are these guys and they're called variable resistors. Uh, you may also know them as potentiometers or POTS, P-O-T-S. And what makes them unique is that you can actually spin them. So I can spin them one way or I can spin them the other. And as I'm spinning this dial, you can see down here, as I'm spinning this dial, this brown thing is moving back and forth. And what I'm doing is I'm adjusting the resistance. Now, you can't actually see the resistance change. So in order for us to see the resistance being changed, we're going to take the multimeter. We're going to measure resistance which is the omega or the ohms symbol on this end. Now I'm going to go ahead and set it to 20 kilo ohms. So what this is saying is that this multimeter can read up to as high as 20 kilo ohms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my potentiometer. I'm going to go grab the middle wire, which is the purple one. And I'm going to hook up an alligator clip to it and that purple wire is essentially the wiper. 
that's connected to that little brown thing that's spinning. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the test lead and I'm just gonna connect that alligator clip onto the black test lead. Then I'm going to take the red alligator clip and I'm gonna connect the test lead to one end of the alligator clip. And then the other to the middle part. Now I'm gonna put my multimeter to one end and I'm gonna test the resistance here. So as we can see, now it's reading 3.86 and because it's on the kilo ohm setting over here, then it's at 3.8 kilo ohms. Now let's see what happens as I uh, spin it in one direction. Now as I'm spinning it to the left, I am increasing the resistance. This is as far as I can spin it in one direction. And so at one end, I can get 8.6 kilo ohms or 8,690 ohms. And if I spin it the other way or to the right, I can get close to zero ohms. So in essence, the potentiometer replaces this blue uh, resistor which, which would have went from the battery on this side through the resistor to the positive end of the LED. Put the batteries in. And you can see that it's uh, lighting up a little bit blue. And right now the potentiometer is set to maximum resistance. But let's see what happens as I start to spin the potentiometer to decrease the resistance. Here it is with the least amount of resistance. And as I spin it the other way, I am increasing the resistance. And so that is an example of a potentiometer in action. Now there's a special type of LED called IR LEDs, which are short for infrared light emitting diodes. So if we look on this color wavelength chart of electromagnetic radiation. You've got your gamma rays over here, your x-rays over here. Colorful LEDs that we use are in this range over here. One of the main functions of infrared LEDs is that they're often used to transmit signals to your various electronic devices. So you'll often find them actually in remotes. Your task is to take a photo of an IR LED working. Now some of you may be asking, hey Mr. L, how is it possible for us to take a photo of an IR LED if it's beyond the range of visible light? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, over here is uh, one of my TV remotes, and up top here are the infrared LEDs. And so to see them, just grab your camera phone. And so right now we're looking through the lens of my camera phone. And if you were to push down on one of the buttons, the camera is able to pick up the infrared light, which allows you to visually see it. There it is, so there's, there, there's the IR LEDs off, and here they are pulsing uh, as they're trying to send my TV a signal. Now I want to take some time just to talk about another uh, key component in an electronic circuit. And it isn't electronics per se, but it's crucial to the survival of the circuit. And that's the protective case. Without it, the valuable electronics inside could get ripped and broken. Now one thing to consider is how different manufacturers create these cases with different difficulties of access. For example, this one is fairly easy to access. I just need to flip the tab to the lunchbox. Here's another example of the electronics being fairly easy to access. You just pop the hood. So over here is just the battery. There's your negative, there's your positive. Red for positive, black for negative. Let's see what else there is. Uh, right down here is my fuse box. 
And uh, over here, right down here, there's a sensor, right? And so I can uh, pull it out. There's the little connector pins. I'm gonna put that sensor back in. And some electronics make it a little bit harder for you to access, but you can still do it with the help of a screwdriver. So for example, over here is my DVD player and uh, it's just a sheet metal case wrapped around this plastic box. And uh, the sheet metal is just bent over there with a little screw that keeps the sheet metal there. And some electronics are designed to be a bit of both, like half easy to open and access and uh, half difficult to access. So for example, here's one that's half and half. Now on one hand, our light box over here that we dissected last day is incredibly difficult to open because uh, there are no uh, visible tabs. But on the other hand, there are also elements of it that encourage you to open it, like this battery pack here. All right, I'll leave you alone. Some electronics, like this old GPS unit for the days of Google Maps, are complete sealed packages. And as you look around, there's no real way of accessing this unit without breaking it apart. So a unit like this discourages people from opening it. Well, I hope this video gives you a little bit more supplemental information as you go around your home and look for these common electronic components. Thank you for watching and happy hunting.